Hello lovely people and welcome to the latest instalment in my historical profile series. This time with a regal twist and not in the way you'd expect. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and keeping my internet browsing safe. Historical profiles are a series on my channel where I look at the life of a disabled or LGBTQ plus person from history and talk about what they went through. Sometimes the stories are harrowing like Rosemary Kennedy being lobotomized for just not fulfilling the female role she was expected to perfectly or sometimes totally surprising like Le Montpain, the sword fighting badass teenage girl who made nuns fall in love with her. And if you like the sound of that then don't forget to hit subscribe. Today I'm going to be talking about the royal family which is why I'm sat here dressed like this. I'm just kidding. This is an everyday look. I went to a pub uh, to meet some other babies. Now, when you think of the British royals, you usually picture the Queen in her range of magnificent hats. Golly, that is a nice collection of hats. Surrounded by corgis, afternoon tea, maybe a postage stamp. Does one pay for postage if one is the postage? Well, not today. In today's video, we're going to uncover the little known history of Elizabeth II's uncle, George, Duke of Kent, the bisexual prince. A title we are giving him for this video. Like many LGBTQ plus people in history, we don't always get a chance to learn about them properly as often they're erased from history or their law is just rewritten in such a way that excludes the more colorful, fun parts of their lives. But not on this channel. So, let's start at the very beginning. George was born in 1902 at York Cottage on the Sandringham Estate in Norfolk. He was the fourth son of the future King George V and Queen Mary, but was born whilst his grandfather, Edward VII, was king. At the time of his birth, he was fifth in line to succession to the throne, behind his father and three older brothers, Edward, Albert and Henry. Yes, yes, the second photo is the current Queen's father, who you might know as King George. Yes, his actual first name was Albert. Yes, royal names are confusing. If you've ever wondered, the name that we know a king or queen by, Elizabeth II say, is called a regnal name, and since ancient times, some monarchs have chosen to use a different name from their original name when they take the throne. Now, you may choose to take another name for any number of reasons, such as maybe you were born on the 34th anniversary of your great-grandfather's death, and then named after him, because everyone's really scared of your great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who's like, absolutely never gotten over it and is still deeply in mourning and makes everyone else mourn with her. But you don't really want your legacy to be tied to that forever and you really don't want to be the first ever King Albert because that's a lot. That's a real lot. That's a lot, lot to go on your shoulders. Also, your dad was also called Albert, but he chose to be called King something else as well. So really, it's fine. It's really fine. It's totally fine. It's okay that you did that, Albert. It's but back to Prince George. Since the future king and queen already had an heir, a spare, and another spare, George was allowed to follow a slightly looser path than his brothers growing up. And it was clear that he was different and more intelligent. Whilst the other boys were groomed to follow the royal tradition, George was musical, jaunty, he had a cheeky sense of humor that meant he liked to tease his father. The brother above George, Henry, had been the first British royal to ever attend school. And George followed in his footsteps, at first prep school and then Eton College, where unlike Henry, who was uh, not especially bright, but had been good at sports and maths, George flourished, becoming fluent in French and Italian and displaying a keen intellect alongside a strong artistic streak. His number one love was piano, which his mother adored and encouraged him to pursue. One little known and sad fact was that post-childhood George was generally known as the youngest prince, but there was in fact a fifth son, Prince John, who had learning disabilities and a seizure disorder. George adored and loved his little brother, but didn't get to spend much time with him as he was sadly kept away from the family and the public as they didn't know how to deal with him. Prince John died at the age of 13 when George was just 17 years old. There's actually a really great dramatization of Prince John's life by writer-director Stephen Polyakov in his television series, The Lost Prince, which sort of explores the story of John, his relationship with his family and Prince George, the political events going on at the time, such as the fall of the House of Romanov in 1917 in Russia and the love and devotion of his nanny Charlotteville. It portrays the teenage Prince George as being artistic, intelligent, sensitive and notably sympathetic to his little brother's condition. The series is from 2003 so it's a little hard to find but you can watch it on Amazon Prime Video. I mean you can't if you're in England but you can if you set up your Surfshark VPN to the United States of America. And that's just one of the things Surfshark can do for you. Oh yes, we've moved into the brief ad section of this video, just roll with it. 
Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to surf the web safely, as well as changing where the internet thinks you're located. And one of my favourite things about the service is that one account can be used on an unlimited number of devices, so I can secure all of my electronic devices and all of Claudia's. It even works on smart TVs! Save yourself from the cookie monster with ease, thanks to Surfshark. It's genuinely a great service, and it makes me feel like royalty. By allowing me to protect my data and identity from thieves, protect my privacy online, publish without a geotag, keep my web browsing private, prevent internet throttling, and save money when booking plane tickets and hotel rooms. So click the link in the description or go to surfshark.deals slash jessica and use code jessica for 83% off Surfshark plus three months extra for free. They offer a 30 day money back guarantee so you don't even have to worry about it. You can just go, 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 go. Click the link in the description down, down there, down there, that's down. And back to the video. When the time came for George to be a mature young man, he had missed the chance to serve in World War I, but was dispatched by his father, who believed deeply in the Navy to a degree bordering on obsession, to the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. This didn't sit very well with George, though. I mean, he had terrible seasickness. He tried on purpose to be bad and came second bottom of the class. Oh, sorry, no. Sadly, you don't get kicked out if you're a prince. Mm. Sorry, George. Instead, George wanted to be both a pilot and living it up in post-war London. It was the 1920s. There was jazz, fashion, dancing, and he was quite the catch, obviously. I mean, like the prince thing aside. George is tall, he's handsome, he's got dark hair, blue eyes, a witty sense of humour. I mean, <laughs> slightly wasted on intense seasickness, let's admit. But then, 1922 hits, and during a leave of absence, he meets Lady Alexandra Curzon, also known as Baba. He fell head over heels in love with her slim figure, chic demeanour and clever wit. She even taught him how to drive, which apparently was a bit hair-raising. And as someone learning to drive in the hopes of finally taking my test for the eighth time, I can only say, relatable. When he was back at sea, he bombarded Baba with love letters, but oh, the feelings were just not mutual. And she married a man called Fruity, Fruity Metcalf, leaving George heartbroken and rather taken to the booze. At age 21, George attended a show featuring the performer, Noel Coward. After the show was over, he asked to go into the dressing rooms, and whilst he was alone, it was said that he tried on some of the stage wigs to see how they looked before meeting Noel in the flesh. And what a meeting it must have been! According to contemporary sources, Coward, proud of who he was, helped George realise his bisexuality for the first time, and the two built a relationship of pure love. Not that it could go anywhere. When you're a prince who is basically born to Marion, aristocratic girl, and procreate. But their on-off relationship continued for the rest of George's life. Once, they were even caught by the police in wigs and heels clacking down the street in the West End. Of course, being queer at the time was illegal, so they were immediately arrested, but a quick, <laughs> that's my dad on your postage stamp, goes a long way. You get away with a lot when you're a prince. And speaking of princes, you get away with things. Now, George's brother was Edward, Prince of Wales, who you may remember from such media as The Crown and Oops, Am I or Am I Not a Nazi? A fellow prince with a self-indulgent streak who liked women smoking and getting back at dad. George started to hang out more and more with him and they, they did whatever they wanted to do. Music, theatre, dancing. George even entered a tango competition under a pseudonym in the south of France and won it. Despite the eight-year age gap, the brothers shared the same wit and lust for life that made them darlings of their shared social cycle, and very close. And Edward was happy to have at least one brother who shared his floundering tendencies. George's affairs included musical star Jessie Matthews, writer Cecil Roberts, actress Gloria Swanson, cabaret star Florence Mills, socialite Ethel Wigram, and novelist Barbara Cartland. Until, in 1925, he fell deeply in love again and proposed to a woman called Helen Azalea Baring, known as Poppy, the daughter of Sir Godfrey Baring, first baronet of Nubia House. She was one of the bright young things. Think, you know, rich, arty, aristocratic, but terribly modern. They had sex. And had also, <clears throat> I had a thing with his older brother Bertie six years earlier that had even led to a proposal. Their mother, Queen Mary, had made it clear that that wedding was never going to happen, particularly considering Poppy's reputation of being fast and fun-loving. This time, when George then had an affair with and proposed to Poppy, it was his father, King George, who objected to it in no uncertain terms. George was sent to join the British fleet in China in an effort to keep the two of them apart. 
and it worked. Until he found someone his parents would definitely consider much worse. Alice Kiki Preston was an American socialite and a member of the Happy Valley set, a group of expats living in Kenya. Kiki was noted as a scandalous presence, known for her beauty as well as her wild lifestyle, which had earned her the nickname The Girl with the Silver Syringe. A notorious drug addict, she took heroin, cocaine and morphine and injected herself at social gatherings, oblivious to onlookers. She first met George in the mid-1920s and through 1928, when he stayed with friends of Prince Edward's in Happy Valley, steadily introduced him to cocaine and morphine, among other drugs. They also formed a menage a trois relationship with Jose Oberu, bisexual son of the Argentinian ambassador to the UK. Once George returned to the UK with Kiki, Prince Edward was aghast to discover his little brother's new habit and did what any good brother with a lot of money and influence would do, effectively banned Kiki from the country and locked George up in a palace to go fully cold turkey. Severe, but it worked. For years afterwards, Edward feared that George might relapse to drugs if he maintained his contact with Kiki. He was clearly correct, as in 1932, Prince George ran into Kiki at Cannes unexpectedly one last time and it had to be removed almost by force. Edward later shared with friends and wrote that he believed his brother had fathered several illegitimate children, including a son by Kiki, Michael Canfield, who was adopted by an American couple and went on to marry Caroline Lee Bouvier, the younger sister of First Lady Jackie Kennedy. George had by this point stopped turning up to work at the Royal Navy. He would probably just as glad to see the back of him as his stomach was to not be on a ship again. And the Royal Court knew something needed to be done. So in 1931, the palace decided to pack him off to South America on a royal tour, a chance for George to experience new culture, mature, and take part in lots of royal engagements. He didn't go alone though. They wanted him to travel with someone who is suitable, stable, supportive. Yeah, no, no, they went with Edward. He did at least get him off drugs that one time, so you know, go Edward! The trip was spent being drunk, not turning up to meetings and more partying, <laughs> until they returned back to London in pretty much exactly the same state that they left in. But they were at least quite popular with the public, thanks to being attractive princes who liked to party. Because you know, a scandalous prince is a good thing, but a scandalous princess. By George's 30th birthday, the palace had decided that it was Time he settled down and made a fresh start at respectability. He earned his pilot's license and began working in the foreign and home offices, becoming the first British royal to work in the civil service. But there was still the question of marriage, because um, marrying a man was not going to do it. The palace tried to line him up with a few women, including Princess Ingrid of Sweden, but uh, George was having none of it. He wanted to choose his own wife, one just as sociable and glamorous as himself, and he found her in Princess Marina of Greece, a granddaughter of both King George I of Greece and Tsar Alexander II of Russia, and his second cousin. Okay, yeah, cheat sheet, his grandmother and her grandfather were siblings. So they had shared great-grandparents, and as royal families go, that's not actually that bad. <laughs> Click the link in the corner of the screen or go down to the link in the description box for that video. She was also his mother's goddaughter and very much approved of by Queen Mary, despite being utterly penniless and without a country to her name, as the Greek royal family had been forced into exile when Marina was 11, following the overthrow of the Greek monarchy. P.S. Yes, she indeed was a cousin of Prince Philip, our current Queen's husband, so their children are related to the Queen's children on both sides. Once George set his mind on someone, he really set his mind on someone. Upon discovering she was holidaying with relatives in Yugoslavia, he rang up and told her he was immediately on his way. Oh, if only everyone was as straightforward with their intentions as George, we'd all know where we stood. He borrowed a plane from his brother, as you do, and flew there pronto. He landed the plane in the middle of a garden party, and a few days later, they were engaged. When Marina arrived in England, ready to prepare for the wedding, she instantly became a fashion icon, and they were known as the most sophisticated royal couple. So good choice, George. He was created Duke of Kent in anticipation of the wedding, and in November 1934, they married at Westminster Abbey in London. The wedding was a grand affair, as it had been more than 10 years since the last royal wedding, with Prince Albert, Duke of York, and Lady Elizabeth Bose Lyon. The wedding was the first royal wedding ceremony to be broadcast by wireless, and the recording control room was placed underneath the unknown warrior's tomb in Westminster Abbey. 
The service was broadcast locally and abroad to other nations and allowed spectators from outside the Abbey to hear the proceedings. The wedding was followed by a Greek ceremony in the private chapel at Buckingham Palace, which was converted into an Orthodox chapel for the ceremony, as Marina was part of the Greek Orthodox Church. Though they kept that one kind of on the hush-hush, you know. The couple got on famously and were the talk of the town. He liked her independent spirit, that she equally enjoyed his fast driving and didn't mind too much about anything else he might be getting up to. They surrounded themselves with equally chic artists and intellectuals, becoming the toast of London. A year after the wedding, they had their first child, Prince Edward, who was later followed by two more children, Princess Alexandra and Prince Michael. Everything was going well for the couple, until 1936, and the country was plunged into mourning for the death of George V, Prince George's father. 1936 is now known as the year with three kings. George's oldest brother, Prince Edward, was the successor to the throne and appointed him personal aide-de-camp when he became King Edward VIII. So that's essentially a confidential personal assistant. But after a few months of being King Edward, he instead decided to abdicate, giving up his birthright to marry Wallace Simpson, a woman he would never be allowed to wed as king. So he left his country and his family in turmoil. As much as the public might have liked and wanted George to be king, as the most popular of the royal brothers, uh, that's, not, that's not really the way these things work. Ever? And instead the crown passed down to the second oldest son, Albert, who took the throne as George VI. There are a lot of Georges. This is kind of confusing, I realise. Roll with it. His brother Albert is now King George. Yes, their father was also King George. We're talking about Prince George. Also there's another Prince George. He's really cute. And I love everything he wears. I know. It's adorable. Anyway, George was appointed his personal naval aide-de-camp. So now he's a confidential personal assistant on... naval things? Water things? Sea things? Hmm. Ships. If you've seen any piece of media made about the abdication or around that time, you'll probably already know that the reason no longer King Edward was so badly shunned by his family was that he stepped down after a lifetime of being groomed for the job and left his brother, who hadn't been but was trying his best, kind of in the lurch. <laughs> Which then exacerbated Albert's underlying health issues since it turned out to be a pretty stressful time to be king, what with literal Nazis running around. It's believed that part of Prince George's work for King George... <laughs> this is going to get confusing. Let's just keep calling him Albert or Bertie. I actually really love the name Bertie. That was on our list. Bertie. It's a good one. Prince George is believed to have been on undercover missions in Germany prior to the official declaration of war in 1939. Using his own and Princess Marina's German family as cover, he was sent in to get a picture on the ground in an attempt to understand the political uprising and bring a picture of the situation back to the UK. Once war officially broke out, George returned to active service, including serving in the intelligence division of the Admiralty. He got promoted to Rear Admiral in the Royal Navy, Major General in the British Army and Air Vice Marshal in the Royal Air Force. Like all members of the Royal Family, whilst in active service, it was obviously attempted to keep them out of harm's way. I mean, what a coup for the Nazis to kill a British prince. Yet he was used in missions to bait the Nazi high command into believing the royal family might be open to peace talks and push aggression away from Britain or else to lure Hitler out. On the 26th of August 1942, Prince George and 14 others took off in an RAF flying boat from Scotland on a top secret assignment with the cover that he was checking military bases in Iceland. Which FYI, if you didn't know, Britain invaded in World War II? We don't really talk about that very much, but awful things Britain's done. We'll just add that to the pile. Yet the plane flew in the direction of neutral Sweden instead. A few minutes after takeoff though, George's plane suddenly swung round and instead of staying on the sea, turned inland, heading into fog and slamming into a Scottish hillside. All but one aboard were killed, making Prince George the first British prince in 450 years to be killed in active military service. All papers relating to the mission mysteriously vanished, leading to speculation and several conspiracy theories. Was he meeting American generals to liaise on coordinated attacks? Was the prince on a secret mission to Sweden to negotiate peace with the Nazis? Was he intentionally murdered by the British government? Prince George died aged 39 and was buried in Queen Victoria's mausoleum at Frogmore Hall. 
His six-year-old son, Prince Edward, succeeded him as Duke of Kent. Princess Alexandra was just five, and Prince Michael was only seven weeks old when they lost their father. Noel Coward was amongst the mourners at his funeral and reportedly said on the Duke's death, I suddenly find that I loved him more than I knew. Prince George was stylish, cultured, and dedicated to searching for his purpose in life. It's interesting to think what might have been had he lived beyond the Second World War and what else we might know about him today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more from my historical profile series, then click the card in the top left-hand corner of the screen or the link in the description below, and let's have some fun together. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Remember to click the link in the description and to use code JESSICA for 83% off plus three extra months for free. Feel free to suggest other exciting people from history you'd like to see profiled in the comments below. Again, thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in my next video.